So, yeah, so we're recording. Uh, and thanks everyone yeah. for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure once again to, um, to, to have you here. And also a pleasure for um, our speaker, Yusufa, who is a, is a Gambian um, based in Denmark, doing amazing stuff, running a company called IPO Capital. Um, so obviously, we would be um, delving more into what NZP is doing. So before that, I'm just going to share the, the AWS video. Um, they're actually our sponsors. Um, and then uh, we, we straight. So I think you guys can see my screen. Um, uh, no, we, we, we can see you okay, so far. Okay, okay <laughs> yeah. let me just share. Can you guys see right, my there screen? There we go. Now we can, yes. Okay. Can you guys hear the video? Yeah, the sound? I can, yes. I can, yes. yes. I can see it. There's a reason why for the last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We're the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships with the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect uh, with the AWS uh, Start uh, program. Uh, what we do is that we work with startups in the uh, education sector, and we help them build their uh, services on AWS. So we power tech in AWS with diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry. And the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products, so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Lobs. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. And you can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself, solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups that we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that, you know, you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the service team. That is what we're here for. Awesome. Well, yeah, so um, back to the main, uh, yeah. So that's the AWS um, uh, promo video. So uh, currently, uh, we're actually into a partnership uh, with them. So they're actually powering. By the them. way, just really quickly, uh, my yeah. last startup was uh, was was uh, hosted uh, on AWS. So okay. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technical guy, but but yeah, my, my former partners spoke highly of, of the service. So yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they do have amazing stuff. Um, currently, what uh, actually as part of the partnership is really help uh, most of the tech staff uh, who are developing apps and, you know, go into so many stuff, you really have access to their credits. So um, it's like just spreading their outreach uh, across Africa. So um, it's really awesome. Cool. And we're really excited to be part of the partnership and also get a Very chance cool. to also um, host amazing events uh, and have people like yourself to share the stuff with us. So um, it's really great. Um, so I'm just going to start um, um, by Yes, um, it's like customary, obviously, for startup buying. Um, welcome again, Yusufa. Um, Yusufa you. is uh, really one of the uh, one of the Gambians that are really disrupting, and it's really amazing. The platform is just to educate, inspire, and connect. So, we want to have as much information as possible in terms of really what can we do to improve ourselves. And most of us are professional in different areas, but it's never enough to have information that can improve our businesses. Um, some of us are in Gambia and really want to really scale and go to different markets, also have access to investment opportunities. Um, and some are in different parts um, mm -hmm. um, of the world. Yeah. And I think more specifically is how can we leverage uh, the importance of different investment models. So here we have Yusufa, uh, the CEO of IPO Capital. So I'll just allow Yusufa to tell us about... Uh, yeah, I can do a very quick intro. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, yeah, so as, he, as thank you, Moro. My name is Yusufa. I'm the founder and managing partner at IPO Capital. And very quickly, IPO Capital is an investment company that behaves like a private equity company. And when I say behaves, that's because, you know, we don't manage uh, external capital 
So we don't manage other people's money. We deploy, you know, internal capital that belongs to the partners. Uh, you can go on our website and see our partners. And we, we use a private equity tactic called uh, leverage buyouts, whereby, you know, you deploy some of your own capital, uh, as well as attract a bit of debt into a structured vehicle uh, called a, a special purpose vehicle. And, and you buy businesses. So, so that's what we do. We're a business that buys businesses. Um, we're focused currently uh, predominantly on the UK as well as Denmark. I, you know, physically domiciled in Copenhagen, Denmark. So I live in Denmark um, and, and I used to live in the UK. So, um, you know, we're looking for fairly mature businesses. Uh, we're looking for businesses doing a minimum three million pounds in, in revenue. Uh, and let's say up to 30 million pounds in revenue. So between three and 30, that's sort of the sweet spot. And, you know, fairly mature, meaning, meaning they have to be profitable. Uh, I would say doing at least half a, half a million pounds uh, in, in, in pre-tax profits, what's called EBITDA. We can talk a bit about that, but earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. And we, we do leverage buyouts and we acquire these businesses. So we can talk a bit about that, why we do it, how we do it, what we do, uh, you know, over the course of this call. Um, from a personal point of view, as you mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a Gambian, so I was born and raised in the Gambia. I'm very proud of that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, at the age of 14, I, I moved to America. So I lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in Maryland and went to school in Washington, but, you know, same. Um, and I lived there for four years, went to high school in, in America. I then moved to London. I uh, went, to, uh, went to business school in London, the University of Greenwich, for five years. And then finally in 2010, you know, I got to come home. Um, after being away for nine years, I got to come home and, I, you know, I didn't, I, I had never built a business. I never raised money, so I didn't know what to do, but I just knew, you know, mom, I'm going home. And, and, and as all entrepreneurs will know, uh, obviously your parents ask you, do you have a job lined up? How are you going to make any, uh, any income? And these are tough questions for entrepreneurs because, you know, there's a thin line uh, 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 between bankruptcy at all times. But anyway, um, I moved back in 2010 and, and, you know, we were just hustling. So uh, I had two taxis running up and down uh, the country at different times. Obviously, Modu, you, you know, Gambia is a Muslim country. Maybe some members of your audience don't. And, uh, you know, in the Muslim holidays, uh, people eat sheep. Uh, in the same way in America, people eat uh, turkey on Thanksgiving. So, um, you know, in 2011, we bought 96 sheep uh, and sold them and made a profit. We sold it to, um, you know, some medium-sized, large uh, Gambian companies, Africcel, which is a telecom company, global properties, et cetera. Stuff like that. I was exporting commodities to China and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't have a platform like this model. So I think this is very, this is very powerful uh, and, and I commend you. Uh, very quickly to wrap up the story, uh, in 2013, I moved to Denmark. So I've been here now for seven and a half years. Uh, when I first came here, I, I didn't have any friends, as you can imagine. I didn't speak the language, so that was difficult. But uh, soon enough, um, I did some advisory work, and soon enough, I started a, a technology startup. And I was the CEO of that company, and my responsibility was, you know, human resources, financial re resources, uh, communicating the vision. And with financial resources, we had to raise money multiple times. So uh, I raised, you know, five rounds of, of funding uh, in that company, uh, four of which were uh, angel investments uh, from angel investors. We also raised one round of, uh, of seed capital from a venture capital company. And, uh, and after, after three years of building that business, uh, at the peak, we had about 30 employees, uh, some full time, some not. Uh, we, sold, we sold that company, we sold the IP, the intellectual property in that business. And, you know, we didn't make tons and tons of money, but it was a lot of fun. And we learned a lot from that journey. And uh, since then, I, I set up IPO Capital with some friends and some partners. And, and you know, we're having, having a lot of fun. So I'll just quickly say I'm not a, uh, I'm not a engineer. I'm not a finance guy. Uh, I don't profess to have the answers. Um, I'm just a guy. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, probably like everyone on this call. Mm -hmm. And I happen to have raised money, you know, about a dozen times uh, in different setups. So we can talk about anything, but I just want to profess, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know how it is, you know. Yeah. 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 Share. I mean, that's quite interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, so there's a, I mean, as I indicated earlier, I mean, the idea is Gambia is really, um, you know, where I'm from. Obviously, our ecosystem is a bit nascent, but we really have a potential to really improve and also uh, leverage from, from the experience of all the people like yourself that have really done it. But just, I'm just going to take you back. Uh, I'm sure yeah. you know Mama Master, one of your... One of your oh, that's my guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so, yeah, that's my guy. So, yeah, I mean, kind of like the last time, uh, you know, yeah. we, just made like a, we just made a tweet and then it was something special that he wrote and he was like, you know, and he was like, well, Yusufa and I started our business journey in Gambia together about 10 years ago and we've been friends for about 20 years as well and that can explain the similarities. And then he just laughed and then Fun Park is my post exports where we used for back in 2012. We had a daily budget of 200 back then. So, I mean, I mean, the reason why I brought up this tweet was like, me, me, me. I'm like looking at these guys with seven million dollars. Yeah. And this is actually right. like right. what he was doing. Yeah. And you know, 200 dollars, like, I mean, absolutely. You, you know how it is. In so I know how it is. The rule back. was, the rule was, the rule was, yeah. uh, you know, I had a car, Mama had a car, right? So, <laughs> But we didn't have gas money, right? So <laughs> if if you're driving, I, I better bring some 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 gas money, right? In one of his hands, right? <laughs> and vice versa. And you know, and sometimes what we would do is we, we would drive and we would go park at another friend's um, office and mm -hmm. we would hop in that friend's car and you know, just mm -hmm. uh, just hustling, you know, just just mm -hmm. trying to get by, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean the reason why I brought up that is like, I mean, I mean, from someone like um, you know, uh, us that are actually like from here. I mean, you've yeah. came a long way. So we just wanted to hear a bit about yeah. how did it take you for you to live from that experience and, you know, yeah. um, you know, taking you further, further to where you are right now. Like, yeah. I mean, what is it like? Because most of the startups yeah. are actually in that, um, I mean, yeah. in that streamline right now. They actually yeah. leverage it on how can they so, scale. I mean, what, what, one thing that, I, that I've observed uh, yeah. is um, no one will ever give you permission so allow me to 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 explain this you know i i used to i used to think that you know you would get permission right so to start a business you know you, you need permission from experts or from finance guys or from but then i realized you know no one knows what they're doing man seriously right. um very few people right actually know what they're doing and what that means is we're all learning and we're all trying and we're all discovering right. and something interesting is uh if you know exactly what you're doing then it's probably not ambitious enough right, right? Because, you know, you can, you can wake up in the morning and walk out the front door and, and, and let's say go down the store and, and, and maybe buy a loaf of bread. You know how to do that, right? There's no risk in doing that. Uh, but maybe doing something new, trying to build a new business, or if you have an existing business, trying to take it to the next level or whatever. Uh, by definition, you don't know how to do that because that's, what, that's the definition of ambition, right? right? So for me, to answer your question, I've just always, I discovered that early and I've just always been, you know, pushing the envelope and showing up um, showing up is, is, is a big part of the battle. Um, just show up. Right. So, you know, if you want specifics, we can talk specifics, but that's my philosophy. Right. Right. Oh, wow. That's quite inspiring. So, um, so what, well, one of the reasons why obviously, I mean, I kind of thought of like really bringing this, uh, bringing this uh, topic was, you know, like, I mean, investment is really like a hot topic right now. Um, and Africa is really showing the numbers, um, uh, I mean, the prospects are really amazing, um, but more specifically, is like one of the things that we really like do have is like the the lack of information on what investment is about, and yeah. you know the different investment models, and you know like you know we can only understand it like by listening to someone that has done yeah. it. So yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna put my yeah, that makes sense. To, yeah, no, we can we can talk about that. that. No so, idea yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, basically, uh, the simple way to, to think about it is uh, right. the first time you raise money, right. uh, it, it's not a very kind uh, synonym, but this is what people say. It's from friends, family and fools. Right. Uh, right? Yes. And, and, and they say that in a nice way. It's just to say the first time you raise money, uh, it's basically from a very close network of yours. Someone goes, OK, Modu, we know you personally. We know you're a good guy. We know your work ethic. Right. We don't yet know that this is a viable business, but we're going to back Modu right. and their friends, their family, and, you know, fools for lack of a better word. Right. And then what happens is you set up on a journey. Uh, you start getting a bit of traction. Uh, you know, maybe you have some, some numbers you can point at. Maybe you have one customer. Maybe you have right. 50 customers. Maybe you've got some revenue or some inclinations of, you know, early success. And then you can attract uh, money from strangers, um, which typically is called angel uh, raising from angels. Uh, generally speaking, these will be, you know, high net worth individuals or at least people who have, you know, excess income, meaning they have enough to live off of and excess that they can invest. Um, and, and that's typically the second phase. Beyond that, you then raise uh, typically what's called seed, seed investments. That, that could be from an uh, institution. So meaning not just a guy from down the road, but uh, a, 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 
an institution that has a mandate that has raised a fund and who are looking specifically to fulfill that mandate in a very specified way. So in our case, for example, with my last company, uh, we raised four rounds of, of angel funding. Uh, total, it was about two seventy-five, three hundred thousand dollars over four rounds. Um, the first, the first money. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story. I think it's funny. I'll tell you a story that I think is funny. So uh, the first money we raised was about thirty thousand dollars, roughly, and uh, it was pretty interesting because we were part of this startup accelerator program. And, you know, uh, there was rumors, there were different startups and there were rumors. It was like dating rumors of which investor, like which startup, but no one really knew. Huh? So we were just gossiping. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, I then went to the guy who, you know, the rumor was he wanted to invest in my last company, Ati. And I remember he was standing there and he was drinking a drink and I was standing here and I was drinking some water and, you know, I said to him uh, something like, so um, would you, would you like to invest in us, you know? And he said, sure. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he said, but no more than $35,000. And I said, that, you know, so <laughs> like, it was very awkward, you know, like the first kiss. But yeah. um, so, so in that way, I got lucky the first time. But after that, I very quickly learned uh, what it takes. So uh, in my humble opinion, you need three things to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I'll tell you them and then we'll walk through them. So first you need an equity story, an yeah. equity story, and I'll walk you through that. Mm -hmm. Second, you need a data room a data room and uh third you basically need an investor funnel right and and let's talk about that so your equity story is basically who are you right so who's your team what's your story what's your vision um do you have any traction any sales what is the unique opportunity why should someone invest capital in this opportunity versus another opportunity what is that story in, in life you come to learn that it's all about storytelling you can have the best product that does the job faster than everyone else, cheaper than everyone else. But if you can't tell the story, you know, then no one's going to buy the story. Right. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, uh, you know, your startup is not only the product you sell, but your company itself is a product and you're selling that story to investors. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. everyone has had, everyone knows Coca-Cola, right? They tell a fantastic story. Uh, you know, and, and you'll find Coca-Cola in the most remote parts of the world. So they're some of the best storytellers in the world. So you need to learn how to tell a refined story around your business quickly, efficiently, and productively. And that's what I call an equity story. It's a term mm -hmm. I've borrowed. Um, the second thing you need is, is, is a data room. And this is not scary at all, okay? It's basically Dropbox, right? So, you know, everyone, everyone that's on this call has access to internet, right? So Dropbox, you can get a, an account for free. I, I, I don't think I've ever paid for Dropbox. Maybe I have $10 a month, but I think I get, I've used it free. And my data room, what I mean is, you know, if you're telling your equity story to people who you hope will invest in your business, they're going to ask you some questions. You know, it's not just going to be, hi, I'm Yusufa, right. and uh, I would like whatever, right. and money. In between, they want to see something. They maybe want to see a business plan. They want to see something that is typically referred to as a investor deck, D-E-C-K, mm -hmm. which just means investor presentation. Mm -hmm. They might want to see uh, whatever, marketing materials. So instead of panicking every time an investor says to you, send me some information, and you're like, what can I send this person? I mean, uh, you can be organized and you can preempt that request by simply having all relevant materials that support your equity story in Dropbox and you can send them that link and that's a data room. And yeah. in a second, if you don't mind, I'll share my data room with you for our team so that you can yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, the third thing you need is, is, a, uh, is what I like to call an investor funnel, right? Um, I'm a salesperson, right? So uh, I've done door-to-door -door sales, telephone sales, street sales. So I think of life in terms of sales. And, you know, no one is that lucky that the only investor they speak to is also the investor that invests in their business and they never have to speak to any other investor leads, right? You probably have to expose your business to a few investor targets and so that they can, you know, analyze your opportunity and hopefully some of them, uh, you know, convert, right? Or, 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 or invest in your business. Here's a good way to think about it. Right. Um, think about a busy street in a city, let's say Banjo. And um, let's say that 10,000 people walk past that, uh, your front door on your, 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 your store every day in Banjul. And let's say that you sell sneakers, right? It's not everyone who's walking past your shop that wants to buy sneakers that day, right now. 
someone is going to a meeting, someone is late for lunch, someone is in a hurry, whatever. So let's say out of these 10,000 people that walk past your shop every day, let's say maybe 500 of them are actually looking to buy shoes. In Gambia, maybe sleep pass, huh? Right, they want right. to buy some shoes. Uh, so 10,000 walk past, only 500 are your targets, qualified targets. Mm -hmm. And even of the 500, if you if you if you have a, if you if your store is closed and they don't know that you have shoes for sale or slippers for sale, then they can't buy. So right. how do you how do you have impressions? Uh, you know where they can say 500 people are qualified and maybe 250 come into your shop, right? right. Now stay with me here. Huh? 10,000 on the street, 500 want to buy shoes and have the money. Maybe half come into your shop, 250. It's not everyone that walks into your shop will live will will, will purchase a shoe, right? So let's even say you're, you're fortunate and half of them buy a shoe. That's about 125 people. So 10,000 people here walking past the shop and only 125 convert as customers. And it's the exact same with investors, right? right? So if they, one shouldn't assume that you pick up the phone or you go to a meeting with one guy or a woman and they're going to invest. It's unlikely. So you mm -hmm. need to treat this like a sales process, right? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow, that's that's I mean that's amazing. Like putting it like a sales process, and I mean I mean I'm just gonna uh, like really like really have an idea from your end. Like, what has been like a scenario for you, like going out there for a meeting, like and then getting getting really rejected, you know? So yeah. um, you know, I was starting this process obviously of building uh, a new firm that I've been working on, but you know, and then I have a friend of mine that was really perfect in the pitch deck um, that I was gonna send to investors, but he's like. You know, sometimes you send it to someone and it's like, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, right. that's it. And You're then right. like, you get so disappointed. So, and, you know, um, from another perspective of law, like, I mean, I mean, the personality and how you introduce these things and how you work with pitch tech really counts. Like, I mean, if you can really take us like a scenario. Of, sure. What is like the yeah, best, I mean, best way to really tap into these investments? Like, really yeah. Like, so, so let's start with rejection, right? So rejection right. is unfortunately the fruits and vegetables of entrepreneurship. You got to eat your fruits and veggies. You're going to get re rejected. Right. Everyone gets rejected. Elon Musk, you know, the right. rocket man gets rejected. Right. Um, just to give you an example, um, you know, without maybe going into too much detail, uh, right. right now, as we speak, uh, my partner and I were trying to buy two companies in the UK, right. fairly, fairly, fairly large, uh, Together, they do about 13 million pound in revenue right. uh, and about 150 employees. And obviously we're investing some, uh, some capital into that, but we are also attracting some debt into right. that. Right. And, you know, we got rejected with the first debt company. I'm talking eight weeks ago, eight, nine weeks ago. So now we, you know, same thing. We have to send the data room to a new uh, 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 credit facility uh, institution, tell them our equity story. And hopefully within three weeks or four weeks, we can acquire these businesses and overcome that initial rejection. So it's just to say, you know, I got rejected two months ago. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I've got too many stories about being rejected. We, we, we all have. So, so your other question, I guess, was um, how to approach this and how to overcome this. And my suggestion is if you think about it in the, it helps to think about it in the sales funnel, you know, uh, uh, point of view, right? Because then, then you're a bit more realistic and it hurts a bit less. Yeah. Um, so let me give you an example. You, you want to raise a fund. Um, what you should probably do is you should probably put that, those materials in front of 10 times more people than you, than you, than you would think. So if you think that you've got 25 or 30, uh, let's say Gambians to send right. it to, maybe you need to send it to 300 or 500 people, some Gambians, some non-Gambians, um, some holiday makers who have heard of the Gambia. Do you see what I mean? Because right. then if you get rejected by the first 50, you're thinking, oh, it's fine. I got another 250 leads. So that helps, but it, it still hurts. Right. I'll give you another story if you want. I mean, right. we were trying to buy this company because um, there's rejection uh, from someone and then there's just uh, deals that don't work out, right? So Earlier this year in February, we were trying to buy another business in the UK. And I worked on this for over six months. Huh? Right. Blood, sweat, tears, pain, suffering. I mean, I, I, you can imagine. Huh? And, you know, one week before we were going to consummate the deal and buy the business, the company we were buying, their third largest customer went bankrupt. Um, and, and the business uh, does about five million pounds in revenue. And that customer was about a million pounds of revenue. 
So they lost 20% of their future sales like that uh, and like 100% of future profits. And they were owed a lot of money, which they would now not recover uh, because obviously the, the, the customer went bust. Mm -hmm. And within one week, I lost that deal. And same wow. thing, you know, you come home and your stomach hurts and you're just thinking all that time, all that pain, you know. And in my head, we had already bought the business. I was already, the company had a managing director. I was already, you know, working with this guy and making strategic decisions like we owned the business, but we hadn't sent them a penny because huh? we didn't yet. And, and the whole thing went to hell. So you just gotta you just gotta hang in there man right yeah so um yeah i mean we have uh we have some uh, people that are running organization i can oh, i can see eliza's name just popped up on the screen uh, <laughs> uh eliza you're actually dominating our screen right now i can't even see myself but yeah good stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah but i mean i mean ju just i mean we have like different levels of investment right now and obviously we are we actually are a right now and you know, when you look at all these articles like uh, you know, like uh, published, I mean, you, I mean, you have, I mean, you see that most investors are still uh, trying to invest, especially in Africa. But the point is, they are not as connected as they were before, yeah. because of like the limitations of, you know, like um, you know, like the, the distance, and so they actually leverage you know, a lot of networks, like um, the actual background check community, I mean, information. So um, different investment models actually for different startups. So I'm just going to take you like to somewhere like where you're from Gambia, sure. you know, where yeah. you have like more SMEs probably than yeah. medium sized enterprise. So, what is the safest thing for a small business right now to yeah. think of like, because you have many investors that actually come, you have probably many companies that are here, but probably they're going to yeah. start coming in the long run. So, yeah. what should be the safest wealth for investment at the moment? And where should yeah. we really focus and look at? Because it's really important. Like right now, like, I'm in Gambia trying to deal with AFG, but I'm really probably not really sure like where I can target. What kind of investments should I make? Like, should I really go for angel? Yeah. So I really like do crowdfunding? Um, yeah. You know? Like that kind of stuff. Like, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I, I think Gambia is probably ripe for uh, angel investors, uh, yeah. meaning, you know, companies raising money from angels. Right. Um, because, you know, it's a, it's a um, in the grand scheme of things, we say Gambia, but I, I guess really what we mean is, you know, the 20% uh, of Gambia, right, at the, at the coast, yeah. uh, you know, and that's a small community. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of humans and there's not a lot of, you know, by definition, high net worth individuals, meaning not a lot of capital to trade hands. So uh, I think uh, targeting wealthy people. So I'll give you an example. Um, I won't mention the name of the investor just out of respect, but I can tell you when I was there, I was trying to build a chalk factory, you know, blackboard chalk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I approached this, uh, this, this lady, uh, wealthy uh, woman, and she agreed to invest in, in the factory. Um, it was just a business plan. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have samples or anything. And it was about $50,000 at the time. This was 2012, I believe. Um, and she was going to do it. Unfortunately, you know, uh, the president at the time, Yaya Dame, put this woman in jail for some frivolous reasons. And, you know, uh, you know and, and she lost her appetite. Obviously, life got in the way, right? Um, so these are the challenges that it's a different environment. So I, I say two things. One, if you're a startup or business person currently in Gambia looking to raise money, um, I think you should uh, try, first of all, start small. And second of all, uh, uh, approach individuals, you know, and, and go there, invite them. It's a small country, you know, um, don't give up, go to their office and say, you know, you know, Mr. 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 X, uh, I'm here again and I'll keep coming until you come visit, you know, my sites, right? right? All it needs is a bit of money to pour some cement or whatever, you know, use charm um, and really try to work uh, on the charm and try to work on individuals. That's, that's one I would say right. for the future. Uh, Moru, I got to tell you, I think you're the future. I think you and people like you are the future. When you look at, you know, uh, the way investment works, right. investors also have to go and raise money, right? right? So if you look in the West, whether it's New York or California or London, uh, what happens is investors are people, uh, you know, uh, who, who have some platform to say that, look, you know, we are well positioned to identify investment opportunities. And they then go and raise money either from high net worth individuals mm -hmm. or from uh, what's called fund of funds. Uh, would you believe they're literally funds that their only job is to invest in other funds? They don't even get close to the investments themselves. Huh? Wow. So fund of funds or, uh, or, or whatever. 
university endowments, things like that. So mm -hmm. the future, I think, is guys like you, you know, rounding up some Gambians, rounding up some foreigners that have heard of Gambia and saying, look, we're trying to put a whatever million dollar fund together. Uh, and, you know, you, Moru, you know what's happening on the ground. You're close to entrepreneurs. And that's why you're well positioned to to deploy the capital. They could never deploy that capital. Right? Right. And so that's that's the missing link. So that's right. the future, I think. Right. 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 Oh wow! Awesome. So I'm gonna like take you to what you're doing. Um, you know, obviously, as you know, part of the integrating fund is you're able to raise like seven million dollars, right? Um, uh, you know, like and you know, like I think you've used like different kinds of uh, uh, investment and whatnot. So like I think I mean it would be great if you can just walk us through that process. Uh, we also have like some uh, some of the guys that have joined the call. That's actually thinking of like. Uh, you know, they're operating local, but I think they kind of like have the traction to really attract um, other investors outside. So yeah. we've done it like really based on the amount of money. What exactly can you do as well? Well, I would say, first of all, um, get familiar with this idea right. that your company uh, has a story and your job is to tell that story. Right. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, your audience has another idea, but I'm saying uh, don't think of it like pick me and just give me money. Think of it like, you know, my company in three, four, five years will be worth whatever, 50 times what it's worth today because I, I see the future and how can I tell that story? So really refine your equity story. And to be very specific, um, you need to put that on paper in the form of presentations. Um, you need, I don't, you don't need this, but it helps if you have a two to three page um let's say teaser document very high level that's just going through the team the product the traction how much money you want very very quick and then you might need a 20 to 30 page uh, presentation that goes more detail which can talk about the total addressable market competitor mm -hmm. landscape things of that nature um, work on getting your documents together work on refining your equity story and if you don't mind i can sh i can mm -hmm. try to share my screen yeah, I'm, uh, let, let, let's give this a shot. So, okay, there we go. Share screen. Oh, okay. It's disabled. So maybe I can't share my screen. I don't know oh. if you've got the, uh, the abilities to uh, enable that. Mode. Multiple. Okay. Like, I think you can yeah. go ahead. Can you try that? Uh, yeah. Okay. How do I do this? So this is pretty. It's like multiple participants. Okay. Right, right, right. There we go. Can you see my screen? Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is Dropbox. I'm not sure if everyone can see my screen. Yeah, I can see it from my end. Okay, great. Um, so this is this is just Dropbox, uh, and and this is this is uh, if I go to all all files, you can see that I use Dropbox all the time. And here, you've, my last company, Actgene, you've got Actgene Data Room. Uh, here we've got a financials folder. Uh, this has the uh, budget of 2015. It was all zeros, so I won't click. <laughs> this was. Uh, this, <laughs> you know, I'll, 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 I'll save the shame and embarrassment. Um, but if I go back, um, here we've got you know a folder with more information. Uh, so right. board meeting minutes. Uh, so all of this stuff documented. Wow. Uh, oh, if we go back, absolutely. And then right here we've got a list of board members. So here we've got the business plan. I discovered it's actually uh, not in that folder, but here it is. Oh, okay. So, uh, right. So this is, uh, this is the business plan that we put together when we were raising, um, by the way, I'll share this at the end. So any, everyone can, you know, you don't have to take notes. I'll, it, okay. It'll be a resource. <laughs> um, but you know, so this is sort of, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is it. Right. Um, so, so we took it very seriously. I mean, we went in asking for half a million dollars. We didn't just walk in right. with our thumbs and our mouths. Right? right. You know, this is a competitor landscape business models, how we're going to make money. I mean, and obviously all of this stuff proved wrong in the end, which is fine. And investors know that, right? And then here you've got the team, right? Um, and then here you've got the board, um, right? So, you know, we, 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 we took it somewhat seriously. And then there's something called a cap table, which mm -hmm. is basically just uh, the ownership structure uh, at that particular time. So here you've got the ownership structure at that particular time. Uh, so we took this very seriously and, and, you know, we went in and, and we meant business. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know how to unshare. How do I do that? I think I go here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I guess I'm back now, but yeah. I just wanted to give you a flavor. Right. Um, right. we didn't just go in there. 
You right. understand? Right. So, so again, let me just, please allow me to just say this one more time. First thing, equity story. Really sharp. Who are you? Why should anyone pick you? Why should anyone, excuse my French, give a shit, you know? Um, two, data room, Dropbox, all these materials that are relevant so that if an investor says, I'm a bit busy, but it sounds a bit interesting, send me some materials. Bow, you send them a link and they can just go and discover your universe and they can make you know, qualified decisions. Equity story, data room. Third thing, treat it like a sales process for crying out loud, you know? Uh, investor funnel. Don't assume that 10,000 people walk past my, you know, boutique in our, you know, no. uh, a shop uh, in Gambia and therefore right. I'll have 10,000 customers. You won't, right? So treat it with the respect of a sales process and therefore, you know, try and speak to, try and engage with a lot of investors. And it's a process. You speak right. to investors, you get feedback. They said no. Why did they say no? You go back to your equity story. You refine that story. You update it in your data room. You hit them again. They said no again. You go back. This doesn't stop. Right, right. Awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I mean, to go to, like, obviously some of the stuff that all of us go through, you know? Like, uh, yeah. like sometimes you really, like, regret making certain decisions in your life and I mean you really would have like really tried to do better or like you have really like people trying to you know notch down um, your ideas so what's it like for you like being you know after raising like or even in that journey I mean we all go through that but I think yeah. it's like great to really share like what do you think like you could have done really better at some point yeah. um, in this process and you know what yeah. did it work like what didn't work you know it'd be nice to hear that yeah. You know, I can like study from you. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, this is just a personal lesson for me. Right. And I wouldn't necessarily uh, I'd give it out as advice, but I'll tell you from a personal point of view. Right. Um, up until recently, recently being three years ago, I was 100% heart and zero brain. Right? right. And what I mean by that was I did things and engaged in businesses that um, you know, may or may not uh, ever prove to be profitable or, I mean, my DNA company, for example, that was a great idea. Right. And obviously we could have been lucky and it could have been a billion dollar business, right? That's what the investors were investing in. Right. But in reality, every month, more money went out than money that came in. And that is, uh, that is not a winning uh, value proposition. Huh? Right. So, so, so now, personally, I'm very... Uh, I treat businesses as a business. I'm very focused on, you know, top line revenue, what's coming in, right. you know, second line cost of goods sold. What is the cost of this is coming in, uh, you know, operating profit after our cost of goods sold of raw materials under operating profit, you know, then you have uh, whatever, then maybe you've got pre-tax profit. Okay. Then you pay your taxes. Now you have net earnings. Then from net earnings, what do you then do? Do you retain the earnings or do you, do you invest in, 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 in investment capex or do you pay out a dividend? So that flow of funds is very important to me and I'm treating business as business. But that's just a personal lesson. Right. Obviously, Steve Jobs, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever, the Snapchat guys, the WhatsApp guys, right. when they started, there was no business model. It was just a love and a passion. They built the technology, they solved the problem, they ended up becoming billionaires. But I think more time than not, um, if you don't pay attention to, to, to the money and the flow of funds and how you stay uh, solvent, it's very dangerous. So that's just the personal uh, lesson, what I would do differently. Regarding um, you know, the early days and even today, frankly, but particularly early days with people holding you or me down and not letting you through. You know, when I was trying to do this chalk idea in Gambia, Right. I, had, I had nothing. I was rolling around with Mama. He probably even dropped me off at this particular meeting in his car. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the school. I can't remember the school. And mm -hmm. I told them, you know, I, I'm here to talk to the principal. I, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I sell chalk. Do you have a factory? Not yet, but <laughs> soon. Yeah? And, uh, you know, I had my samples. And then I went in and I remember because I could hear these two ladies when I walked past. They were, they were making fun of me and they were saying, I'm a businessman, you know, I'm a businessman. And they were emulating me and making fun of me. And I really felt like shit that day, you know, I didn't, I didn't go into that meeting from a positive place. I went in, you know, questioning myself and that's just life, you know, that's how it is. Um, they were right though. I never did build that chalk factory, but <laughs> so you should hunt them down as investors, you know, they'll, 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 they'll at least save you some money.
Yeah, awesome. So basically, I mean, we're not going to like really keep the like the conversation really long. I, I mean, we have a lot of people that join, but we really wanted to like ask questions so that we can really, because our events are not that long. Um, just Great. about what we really want to. Um, so uh, we have um, um, so challenge from his audience in Mamadi, uh, Mamadi is saying is in some of the most interactive research we we'll make in this session um, um, that he's attending in months, which is is just what we want to do to really help out. So I'm gonna, um, Jason, do you have any question you would you like to um, put out to you so far? Or? Oh yeah, it would be interesting. Um, this one, you, you're very, you're very impressed, impressed by, by what you've you done and coming, coming from Gambia, Gambia to where you, where are, you are now. You believe, believe that, that um, young, young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in Gambia also have, have, have the opportunity to be make their vision known. So, so, so as, 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 as young as you, as you are, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your take, take and what's your thought, I say, say uh, advice, advice to young, young entrepreneurs like us who are trying to make it from Gambia? What is that? Uh, uh, advice, advice that you have, and when you back and, back and report what you were saying earlier, I just started not having it, and, and, so and some of us are asking ourselves in the situation as it was, but the passion and the drive that we have to be pushing on. So what is your advice in that aspect? Can you relate to us having that experience? What do you have to tell us? Is it keep pushing, give up, or Pack up and go do something else. Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's exactly uh, what you said, which is keep pushing. I would add one caveat, which is to say, um, you know, maybe keep pushing and try to see, try to study your environment and try to study your market. Uh, I will move back to Gambia at some point. I currently live in Denmark, but you know, if I lived in Gambia or when I live in Gambia, I probably won't run a business like the one I run now or like the one I ran before. These companies uh, fit well within this particular environment where there's more free access to capital, um, mm -hmm. credit and things of that nature. And I think given that you guys are in Gambia, I would say just look around and, and, and try to find uh, opportunities that fit well. Can, I'll give you an example. Um, you're all aware of, uh, of, of, of Mayor Bensuda, right? Talek Bensuda. And, yeah. you know, today he's the mayor, but before that, he, he, he's an entrepreneur, right? And, and what yeah. he did was, um, Talib used to work at an insurance company called Takaful. And, you know, he would drive around those days. Uh, he, had a, he had a Takaful, uh, you know, a, a small car right, that he would drive around in. But what he was doing was he was going around from the shops uh, in Banju and trying to identify their problems. He didn't walk in with solutions. He didn't walk in and say, you know, you need this very expensive uh, mobile phone from the States. He walked in and said, what do you need? And through this Q&A, he discovered that there were certain products that they needed more than others. One of these products was a diapers, right? And what he did was he then said, all right, he contacted some uh, manufacturers in, I believe, India and ask for some samples. Sometimes you can even get samples for free if you cover shipping, if they believe that you might uh, be a customer. He ordered some samples and he ordered like 10 samples and he went back to those same shops, you know, 50, 100 shops and said, which of these quality do you like? Took notes, the one that was most liked most of the time. He then went back to the Indian company, negotiated a price, probably went and raised some money from somewhere and then shipped his first half container, right? And then he brought this container of diapers uh, to Gambia. And the innovation in that, in that uh, explanation or uh, in that example is that, you know, most of the diapers in Gambia, maybe things have changed now, but three, four years ago, they were diapers that were branded, you know, for Indian consumers or Chinese consumers. So you have a South Korean baby, you know, crawling mm -hmm. uh, in what is not an African environment. Come on. Exactly. So what he did was he simply, he named it Baby Mariam Diapers. I think they're still for sale. Mariam yeah. after his niece and he took a photo of his real niece. This is a real Gambian baby, right? Slapped mm -hmm. it on the, 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 the marketing materials and he was in business. And at some point he had to take risks. So he discovered that uh, these people, these uh, traders, they typically, uh, they're cash poor, but they make a lot of money, but they're cash poor. So if you want them to take your diapers and pay you today and go sell it, you, you won't go anywhere. So at some point he had to close his eyes and just give half a container of diapers, his whole uh, working capital, as a risk, but then they came back and they came back and they came back. And that's a very successful business. He repeated that business model, went into the tomato paste industry, right? I think he's got uh, Ami, Ami's paste. Ami is his mom, Auntie Ami. Same thing, 
took a real Gambian, slapped it on the packaging. So these, those business models work in that environment. Obviously, you wouldn't get anywhere trying to do that import, you know, uh, made in India, diapers, slap an African baby and sell it to British people in England, right? So you have no to be way. realistic, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Oh. Okay, so, uh, so, so basically, we have uh, uh, okay, so we have a uh, Paju. Uh, this is written first um, and foremost. Thanks, Modo Yusuf and team, for creating this insightful webinar. Well, we thank you so much for joining us. One quick question. Um, Pa is saying, can you give insights on how do one protect their idea from investors taking their idea and running away with it? That's an interesting question. I love that question. I love that question. I love that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's two answers to that question. Um, yeah. I'll tell you the first answer, then I'll tell you the real answer. So the first answer is, generally speaking, uh, even if someone hears your idea, thinks it's a great idea, has the capital, has the time, has the resources, they probably still will not take your idea. And even if they do, they probably will not execute it as well as you have. And even if they do, they might even fail. Yeah. So, so there's some risk, but the risk is, is controllable and it's minimal. And obviously maybe you, you expose more based on trust. So you might have two data rooms, right? A light room and a full room, for example, to address your question specifically. Um, I will, though, I will though admit, you know, I'm a Gambian huh? and I grew up there and my family is Gambian and everyone is there. But I will admit that in Gambia, we have this feeling that, you know, we don't innovate, right? This is the feeling we have as Gambians, right? We feel like if I start a car wash on Kota Junction, then within three months, another car wash will be there, you know, Kota Junction, right? And that's because there's some truth to that, right? Um, if, we're being, uh, if we're being a bit, you know, tough on ourselves, we might say that, you know, Gambians maybe want to wait and see that something is succeeding before they do the same thing. There's a reason on Gympex, there's like 30 stores to buy cement. What's the difference between Cement Shop 27 and Cement Shop 28, right? They probably even have the same brands. So I, I do empathize with that. I guess try to do something that's not commodities based. If your business idea is, you know, import cement, sell it at the same price, then that's probably a non-protectable business model. But if your business model for example, like Talib, is to actually go and investigate the market for diapers, create a brand, then on the back of that, what you get is you get a new market and you have some brand equity, right? So every year that your competitors haven't jumped in, they're still trying to sell Korean baby diapers and you're selling Gambian baby diapers. Every year you're building some brand equity. So uh, it's worth sharing your idea with qualified, credible people, you know, and, and that's a controllable risk, right? Okay, right, so if I can come um, in, Maru. yeah, so we have Karim. Uh, Karim is actually uh, also a Gambian, uh, uh, quite an amazing person, doing amazing stuff. Um, Maru, can you hear me? Sometime back in Gambia, you guys okay, I think Pa has something to say. Pa, do you want to? Yes, Maru. okay, okay Maru. Maru and Yusuf, uh, actually, thank you for um, you know, touching on that question. Uh, I really appreciate the insights. And like you said, obviously, I'm from Gambia as well, born and raised, but I'm based in the US, US actually. So I'm looking to, I've started some initiatives in Gambia, but I'm looking to expand to additional investment. And just like, I, just like you mentioned regarding protecting your idea, I know you've mentioned about the data room, sharing, obviously, your, um, your artifacts with a potential investor, and that puts you at a risk. Obviously, because once you share that, they can take that along and take it and, and obviously um, mimic the idea and do whatever they want to. And beyond that, also, even in Gambia, like you said, we don't have that many innovators. Many people, obviously, unfortunately, like to copycat. Yeah. You know, so situations like that put you at a risk. Yeah. So I'm glad that you, you touched on this. And the fact that you also mentioned about the light room and full room, that's a good idea. Because mm -hmm. something that you can one can actually utilize instead of sharing your full room or data exactly. room, you can share a light that has just basically snapshots of your idea. And you share that. Hopefully, if the if the potential investor is really interested, then you can have a sit down, walk through the entire full idea. So I like that, and I appreciate you sharing also 
what Talib did because that's a similar yeah. idea I have. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a similar idea actually I have. I have some connections in the Western world and all the way to Asia that I'm looking into branding, bringing along a new product in the market. I was supposed Very to be in Gambia cool. recently, but because of, because of this COVID that has um, impacted that. But now that you've said that, that's actually a good strategy. That's a thing I, um, I was planning to actually also do once I get on the ground. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you all no, for fantastic. providing this as well. No, thank you for your kind words. And um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's worth the risk. Um, one last thing I will say, I hope you guys can hear me. This battery died, but this one still I can, works. I can hear you on my side. Good. Yeah. Good. Don't be, and, and maybe I'll use the word scared, but you know, don't be scared to push the investors. Don't be scared to push back. Huh? You know, the, um, it, it's a bit difficult, right? Uh, obviously, when you are trying to get capital and you have an idea and you want an investor kind of to pick you and to put money in your, into your business, it, it's easy to fall into this feeling of I need them and they don't need me. But the opposite is true, Padu. Right. Uh, all the investor has is money. That's true. Think about that. And money has to go to work. Money has to multiply. Money has to generate income. Uh, it has to generate either interest or, or dividend income. Uh, and, and what you are offering them is an opportunity to multiply their money faster than other vehicles, adjusted for risk, of exactly. course. So if you have a business idea or an opportunity that could be profitable, that you, know, you are the right person to execute, and you have some traction, some evidence to, to justify an investment, Right. Uh, they actually need you more than you need them. Isn't that funny? But most entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. they don't have this. Uh, they don't have this attitude. I mean, l l look at Modu for example, right? Mm -hmm. If a, if an investor wants to access Gambian startups, and they're based in the West, how can they do it? They need Modu. That's true. How can they do it? How can they do it? So you know, this is it. It's reverse. When you go and you present your case, you say to them, look, either you say that you don't want access to Gambian startups, and that's fine. That's fine. If you don't want that, that's fine. But assuming you do, meaning a qualified lead, then they need you. Uh, that's your value proposition. So this is an interesting thing to digest. And it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of chutzpah. But right. the funny thing is, once you digest it, you also approach them with a certain, you know, a certain confidence. And, and that's, that helps. It's so funny. You approach with the, I don't need this. I don't need you. And a funny thing happens. They think, Jesus, why does he not need me? I want him to need me. You know, and right. so, yeah, it's just, it's just a bit of advice. I don't know if that was relevant. Good, but anyway. Good. thank you. Thank you all. All right, awesome. So Karim, um, Karim, uh, you can just share. Uh, Karim has been raising his hand for a while. Good to see you, bro. You can just share. Good to see you. How's it going, Modu? Uh, hey, Yusufa, how are you guys doing? Doing great. I, I have a question, but I also wanted to add on to um, the idea of uh, protecting your business idea. I think sometimes um, uh, maybe a little bit more of thinking about Gambia than my business idea. I'm not scared to share a business idea with people as long as it develops the Gambia, right? Mm -hmm. As long as they use it and it helps people's ideas or help people in their daily lives. That's fine because I have my brain. I can use my brain to think about other options within that business idea. But um, my, uh, my question is the challenge um, we usually have, especially if you want to invest uh, with uh, entrepreneurs in Gambia. Sometimes it's kind of difficult because they either overvalue the business they're starting to do or they get overly confident about trying to talk to you about the business and how you can invest and the information that they're given. So what advice do you have if we have some Gambian entrepreneurs here for them to look into whatever business they have and how they can communicate with an investor as far as not overvaluing their products, but knowing that, okay, some investors don't come in with just money. They come in with ideas. They come in with... Uh, whatever thing they can add to the business, not only money. So that's my question on that. You're exactly right, uh, Pat, uh, uh, Karim. Uh, uh, thank you for, for, for putting that forward. Uh, valuation is a problem. It's a global problem. Uh, and 
every entrepreneur, you know, or business owner believes their business is worth more uh, than, let's say, an investor would be willing to stomach. Um, I think one has to be realistic with the market that they're operating in. So if you're operating, if you happen to be living in, let's say, America on the West Coast in Silicon Valley, right? And, you know, you were, you were born uh, there and you have a certain level of, you know, local credibility in Silicon Valley and you have some technical abilities and you've built a, a prototype of a technical product and you can very clearly articulate the value proposition of that product in Silicon Valley. Then, you know, you can walk up to a Silicon Valley investor and say, give me $5 million for, you know, 15% of my business. And they may consider it. They may do it. They may not do it, but they would consider in that environment. On the other hand, you know, in a place like Gambia, where capital is not loosely spread around, we don't, to the best of my knowledge, have financial institutions dedicated to deploying capital. We don't really have a culture of investing excess cash. People, what do they want to do? They want to build a second home, a third home, a 17th home, right? They're not thinking about backing the young guys. It's, it's a tough value proposition. So in between these universes, one has to find their sweet spot. Um, it helps when you have a few companies that set the agenda. So I'll be more specific. Um, it's a bit like, maybe some of you know this, but it's a bit like in the fashion industry, right? So you have the runway models, right? And they wear big feathers on their shoulders and, you know, whatever, gladiator outfits. And no one in their right mind is going to walk onto the street with a gladiator suit and big feathers, right? But, but why do they do that? They do that to inspire, right? So if that's what's in the runway, then downstream in the retail stores, let's say H&M or Zara or whichever stores, they might interpret that and they might have an arch in their shoulder that's white. So it's the retail version of a wing. You know what I mean? And that's what people would wear on a daily basis. The same thing happens in, in finance. So if at the very top, uh, money is loose, like right now, you know, uh, governments are printing money and interest is low. Let's call that the, the, the fashion uh, uh, stage, right? That trickles down. The guy under, you know, the guy managing $10 billion goes, well, money is cheap, money is loose. We're willing to take bigger bets. We're willing to push more capital. And that trickles all the way down to the local investor guy in the West who looks at his stock portfolio and says, well, equities are going up, so I'm feeling more generous, so I'm willing to invest more. And if all angel investors have that attitude, then valuations slowly trickle up. So it's all connected. Um, so I think in Gambia, what you'll see happening soon, with, you know, with people like Moru setting up events like this, um, it, entrepreneurs raising money is, you will start to see a standard, right? And maybe the standard will be, you know, credible entrepreneurs in Gambia who are, you know, have, have some traction, you know, maybe they'll raise $50,000 for 10%, for example, of their business, valuing that business, for example, at half a million dollars. And if that happens enough times, right, with some credible names and some credible investors, then the next person can go and say, well, look, I'm not as good as uh, Mr. Jaban over there, you know, who raised $50,000 for 10%. But, you know, you give me $50,000, I give you 25%, right? So it's a trickle down, it's trickle down economics. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's just like in Gambia, we don't have a, 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 a car market. You go and you try to buy, you know, let's say a 10-year-old SUV, some guy at Fajara will tell you, you know, two million dollars, <laughs> and some guy in Banjul will tell you seven fifty. There's no uniformity, right? So I think uh, that will come. But until then, it's about communication. It's about telling the right story to the right person, uh, and it helps if the economy is doing well. I think I'll add one thing. You Modu should probably do something. Either you can come in and teach something on evaluation. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be, be fantastic. No worries. No worries. Okay, thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Karim, for the, uh, for the question. It's really appreciated. Um, so, I mean, we've actually run out of time now. So I don't know if there's anyone that has um, uh, you know, a question. Um, take one more. And then we just wrap up. Um, the cycle, a whole lot of um, you know nuggets being shared in terms of the investment models um, that we can do, and more importantly, also the life lessons that we can actually learn. Um, I mean, we're doing this to really create the awareness. Like we're in the world. These are really extremely hard times. It's important that we have information that we can 
which I'm looking forward to reviewing as a part of the comment to go inside Cyprus. So uh, Alassane has a comment. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, whether you're thinking about uh, investment or whatnot, but he said, what would you do? So maybe we can just wrap up with this. What would you do after COVID? And uh, what lessons have you learned? Uh, but maybe, you know, yeah, can you hear me? And my battery, my battery died, but I'm back now. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. So I was just saying, um, okay. Alassane actually wrote a comment about. Um, I'm not sure whether he's referring to investment here, but he just wrote something very generic. He said, "What would you do differently after COVID, and you know, uh, what lessons um, have, uh, have you learned?" So I think probably is a general uh, COVID lessons. Yeah. Well, I mean, so. I've seen I've seen a lot of things happening uh, both in our business in the UK, uh, but also I have a lot of friends that you know own businesses, and COVID was the, the the black swan that no one could see coming. So that just knocked out uh, a lot of revenue. I mean I can tell you. So the business we own in the UK, for example, in March we bought the company in September. In March they had their best month in history, and in April sales dropped eighty five percent. So it's really hard to prepare for that, right? Uh, from the best month in history to 85% uh, decline in income. And I think what that does, that just scares everyone and everyone goes, so what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Personally, I think a lot of this is luck as well. I mean, I, I, I aggressively chased a lot of businesses last year that if we had bought them and I would have felt you know, satisfied, they might've gone bankrupt by now. I have a very good friend of mine mm -hmm. who bought a hotel last year, a four star mm -hmm. hotel and hotels got hammered. So I think COVID is a once in a hundred year event um, that, you know, one shouldn't, uh, hopefully one shouldn't think about too much, but, uh, but you know, you just hope that you've got the right assets, uh, you know, uh, when, when that hits. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things where you either got lucky or you got very unlucky. There's very smart people that got hurt and there's not much you could have done. So as an entrepreneur, if your business got hurt, the good thing is, it's the one time where you get a green, you know, you get, you don't get a yellow card, right? It's okay. It's not your fault. <laughs> the <laughs> one time. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really insightful. And, you know, I, I mean, we've just come to the end of the, uh, the session and thank you so much Yusuf, for, for doing, you know, like really justice to the topic. Um, I've learned a lot. I mean, uh, I'm sure also the, the participants have also benefited from your insightful um, you know, comments that you've indicated there. So, um, so this, um, just for all of you that are joining, um, this event is actually sponsored by Amazon Web Services. Uh, we actually have a one year partnership with them. Uh, they're also running like a couple of stuff in their penetration across Africa. So if you really are interested in the service that Amazon has, you can reach out to me and uh, we can support. We have a mentorship, um, uh, you know, um, with the partners. We also have opportunities to leverage on the engineers working on Amazon. Uh, we'll be having our first calls um, uh, next week, uh, meaning that um, you know we will be talking to the AWS, um, uh, like, you know, staff and whatnot. So we just want to introduce and connect them to the ecosystem in Gambia, um, so that they can help you. Uh, they also deploy in credits as well, um, like Amazon credits. We've we've also been deploying Google Cloud credits as well. That's a separate partnership. This one is a, a, I mean, it's a selection of um, uh, some of the chapters in Africa that can really push the AWS penetration Africa. So we really inspired and you can reach out to me. Um, I'm all over uh, social media. You can just touch me and then we can we can uh, pick up from there. So thank you so much. So just before I go, I'm just going to share um, the AWS video again. Um, so we can just wrap it up. Thank you so much Yusuf, for taking your time. It's really been no worries, amazing. Um, you know, and can't wait to see you soon also in Gambia. Um, you know, <laughs> in 12 of years. So thank you so, so much. Let me just share the AWS screen and we can just say bye. Uh, yeah, I think you can see my screen. Um, so that's it. Right. There's a reason why for the last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We have the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships with the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect uh, with the AWS Head Start uh, program. Uh, what we do is we work with startups in the uh, education sector, and we help them build their um, services on AWS. So we power tech with AWS with diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really
really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry. And the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products, so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Logs. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. You can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself, solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize the AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups. Uh, we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that you know you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the service team. That is what we're here for. All right, I was actually dancing there. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Yusufa. Uh, we, we will be having uh, another event next month. So watch out and, you know, uh, for anybody that's really going through stuff right now, as you indicated, it's just time to, I mean, it's okay. So <laughs> we just have to survive right now and also learn from the, I mean, learn from the experts, um, see how we can navigate this. But I'm sure we'll be all right after this. We would, we would be able to go back to normal. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm going to log off the call and thanks, Yusufa. Um, thanks to everybody that's joined. It's been amazing. We're also going to have it on YouTube. Don't forget. So go on YouTube, search Startup Grand Banjo. Uh, the conversations will be uploaded shortly uh, once we do the edits and we're good to go. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Ciao. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>